guarantee you this next speaker won't uh, put you to sleep. He'll, he'll keep it uh, active. My name is Patrick Wolf from CAE. Uh, I will tell you that we're not going to have Elvis come out unless Dr. Epps wants to dress up and uh, come out as Elvis, whatever. But I have the privilege of introducing the next speaker, uh, Dr. Chet Epps. Uh, Dr. Epps is a longtime SIB user. Uh, it's been for a long time. Not only that, just an educator just as well. Believe it or not, he was a high school teacher before he went and got his medical degree in anesthesiology at Mount Sinai Hospital in New York. Uh, he's former past president of Society of Simulation just as well. Uh, he's just got a lot of stuff on his resumes. And we sort of have a different avenue today because we sort of got our communication mixed up a little bit. He was going to speak on medical students versus virtual reality, but he says, you know what, I'm going to talk about design of a sim center. I said, okay. So, but I know he would be more than happy to talk to you afterwards or if you just see him in the hallway and he'll talk to you about the virtual reality and stuff like that. Um, he's got some time on his hand. So, <laughs> without further ado, I'd like to introduce Dr. Ted Epps. Patrick. Thank you. So when he says we got our wires crossed, that meant I missed the email. Um, I think the email was, hey, will you talk about this? And I didn't respond, and I didn't know, and I was talking about this. And so if you want to talk about virtual reality, um, catch me this afternoon, because tomorrow I'm going to China. <laughs> so um, <clears throat> this afternoon, talk to me. So you guys have experienced our new building. I just wanted to kind of take you guys through the process of how that was designed taking into account that it doesn't have to be a standalone simulation building, but that it also can just be a floor that you're renovating for simulation purposes. Um, I'm going to tell you about a lot of stuff that I had no part in. So I've been here for two years. Um, this building has been in process for much longer than two years. I'm going to tell you about some things other people that are here on the team, just like Nick Brower, um, have been working on. I won't take credit for what they did, but I will tell you the process they went through. I don't really have any real disclosures. Uh, we have funding from Blue Cross Blue Shield to support operations of our simulation program, so I always disclose that. I'm also the editor of a textbook. I don't receive royalties for it, so um, I am going to mention the textbook. I don't get any money for it, so hopefully you don't find that's a conflict. I do want to point out quickly, we are the center for healthcare improvement in patient simulation. I'm going to tell you a little more about how that name came about later. But we are a center. But we're not only a center, we're also a program. So I start this talk by just pointing out we have a center, which is a physical structure, and I'm going to tell you about the physical structure. But there's also the programmatic issues of how you develop your educational activities how you take your simulation activity out of the physical structure and into other spaces. So even though I'm going to talk to you today about the center, just keep in mind that designing the programmatic piece is just as important, if not more important, than the physical structure itself. So if you look at our building, it's 61,000 square feet total. But of that 61,000 square feet, only about 45,000 is what we call usable space. So all the space for the HVAC equipment and the plumbing equipment and all the mechanical type um, equipment is located, we consider to be non-usable. So we usually say the building's 45,000 square feet because that's how much we actually get to use. Of that 45,000 square feet, about 46% is what we consider programmatic, and then the rest is other space, and we break that down further. The programmatic, about 30% of the space, or 12,000, almost 13,000 square feet, is simulation. That's actually rooms where people are doing some type of simulation activity. There's about 56 rooms that make up that 13,000 square feet. Uh, we have about almost 3,000 square feet of debrief, so we actually have about eight debriefing rooms throughout the building. That makes up about 6% of the space. And then we have multi-purpose classroom spaces that you guys have probably already encountered that have tables and chairs, everything is mobile, the, uh, the tables go up, they go down. We can configure the space for lots of different uses, and that makes up 
about 10% of the space. So that's all the programmatic space. The other 54% of the building or other is really support space. That's 15%. We call support um, because we do lots of things in the space, but most people look at it and consider it storage. So about 15% of our footprint, uh, of our usable footprint is storage. If you read books or talk to people who have been doing this for a while, they suggest anywhere between 20 and 25% of your space being dedicated to storage or support. Um, I think in a 45,000 square foot building, that's probably even more than we need because even with the 4,000 square foot that we have now, excuse me, the 6,300 square foot that we have now, it's pretty sufficient. Enough that we can host an event like this. So most of you, I'm sure, have been in the rooms where 105, 111, where a lot of the vendors are, where you went to pick up lunch. Usually both of those rooms have 12 beds in them. <laughs> we had to get rid of the beds to accommodate the vendors and the food and the people. So part of that storage space really allows us the flexibility to engage in events like this. About 5% of our space is um, office space, and then the other 30 odd percent is really common space. So that would be stairwells, corridors, elevators, bathrooms, things like that. So that's kind of the breakdown of the physical space itself. Some other facts about the project is total <clears throat> about $39.7 million. About 20 million of that is really for the physical structure and the other half went for everything inside, whether it be furniture, simulation equipment, um, medical equipment. Of that 40 million, about 6.5 million was really ear tag for simulation equipment. Um, we bought all new mannequins. We did have a sim space here before. Uh, what happened on this campus was that the College of Medicine had sim space and the College of Nursing had sim space and the College of Health Professions had sim space. So all that sim space closed and everything came central. So in moving everything central, we abandoned all of our old equipment and bought, and we had the opportunity to buy everything new. And we have about 160, what I call numbered spaces in the building, i.e. rooms and hallways that actually have some designation. And as I mentioned before, about 56 simulation rooms. I had fun last night. I counted up the number of cameras in the building. We have 235 cameras uh, in the building. And about 80 of those are SDI cameras. So there's a lot of cameras. Oh, almost as many all-in-one computers. So <clears throat> we took a standpoint of, let's come up with one standard computer design and use it throughout the building, even though we don't necessarily have the same requirements in all rooms, with the idea that that provides us more flexibility and the opportunity to, if one breaks down over here, we can just borrow from over there and use here. So we came up with a standard configuration in about 235 of them, and they're throughout the building. We have a bank of Surface Pros. Those are used primarily for when someone wants to observe simulation live. We have about 85 flat screen monitors that range in size from 40 inches to 90 inches. We have 38 SIM capture rack units, and then we have 44 SIM capture nodes. So the way that we kind of designed this was um, nodes are on the first and third floor, and uh, rack units are on the second floor. A lot of hours in, we have Crestron GUI design for the AV integrator. Um, that was a big chunk of time in terms of kind of creating the interface that we would use to control all the cameras and the microphones. As you go into this and think about your own center or designing a center, building a center, um, keeping in mind that you have to kind of balance the efficiency and efficacy of it and make sure that everyone has input. Thinking about, as you go into it, what the function is for the space that you want to use, what the mission, vision, goals, and purposes are, types and number of learners. What we see people do often is they say, okay, we want to do a sim space, we want to do a sim building, we want to do a sim center. And so you go around and you visit a lot of sim centers and you come back and you try to take all their really good ideas and apply it to your space. Um, that's not really the best way to do it because everyone has different needs. Everyone has different goals, objectives, educational curricula. So looking at other centers is nice. Don't go look at another center and then come back and try to apply it to your space. It's just like trying to hammer a square peg through a 
circular hole. As you go through this process, you need to think about things like what types of space, how much you want to use for support, what kind of training you're going to be doing there. Also, what the adjacency of the spaces should look like. So for us, academically based primarily, we do some hospital work, but primarily university. Like we have a large number of students that we have to get through, so it's really important that we have a place where the students can come, get them in the simulation, in the debrief, and then out the door in a way that flows easily. So a lot of that is thinking about the adjacencies of your simulation spaces to your um, debrief spaces, et cetera. And then also isolation of space is really important, especially for audio purposes. Um, there was a lot of thought in this building put into how to isolate the noise so that when you have a room full of 30 people, it's not bothering the people that are next door. Some of the quandaries, um, I'm going to come back to this slide later and tell you how we address these. But thinking about where you put your office space, whether you have you know, uh, a nurse's station, uh, whether you have real gases or whether you have fake gases, whether you just have compressed air, what your ratio are between the different types of room are all really important. Let's get this. So if you look at the process, there's really six phases that we go through. I'm going to touch briefly on the phases. So the first is actually the space programming. Again, I was not part of this. Nick in the back of the room was part of this. Uh, Teresa Britt was part of this. So Teresa's not here. So a lot of people on campus were involved uh, with the process. But it goes something like this. We decide what the footprint of the building is going to be. And we know that, for instance, on the second floor, there's going to be about 45,000 square feet, excuse me, 15,000 square feet of space. And so they begin to list all the different types of spaces they want in that room. So this is just a snippet of that list. So there's operating rooms, large patient rooms, regular patient rooms, debriefing rooms, and types of rooms you would expect to see in a sim center. And they kind of get a rough idea of about how much of that 15,000 square foot of available space they actually want to dedicate to those different areas. And so they begin to literally, I kind of think of this as a jigsaw puzzle, as you know, create a little box that's proportionate to the square footage that you want to designate for that area. This is one for the ORC section. Here's one for our large patient room. The smaller patient rooms, which would be a little smaller, obviously. Labor and delivery room. We want to have about 60 brief rooms on this floor, and that's about the size we would want them. We also decided to share our control rooms. I'll go into that a little more later. But we needed at least four control rooms on this floor. <clears throat> and you have all of these. There's more spaces, but I'm just going to use this as an example. So then you have all these puzzle pieces, and you got to figure out how they kind of go together in a way that, again, gives you the adjacencies that you're looking for and then allows for the patient flow that you're looking for. And so you kind of shuffle these around, and you get something that looks like this. It says, OK, here's a, let's see, patient room, sharing control room, larger room, sharing a control room, and having two debriefs, smaller room, sharing a control room, and having one debrief. And so you have this space plan that you now take and give to the architect, and you say, make this work in the space that we have available. And that kind of takes us into the second phase of design, which is that schematic design. So during this time, the architect's going to take that space plan, and they're going to come up with something that looks like this. So here's what they came back with at the second floor, doing his best to um, include all of the adjacencies and all the criteria that we shared with him. Um, to really have our patient rooms, sharing control rooms, having our support space, and some office space and classroom space as well. Now also during the second phase, the architect comes back with what the exterior design could look like based on the schematics that they're coming up interiorly. Uh, this is actually the first one. This is not what our building looks like. It just shows you as you go through this process, things change. This was the first design that the architect came back with that um, I actually found by accident looking online somewhere. Nick may know more. My understanding is, this could be an urban legend, I have no idea, but that you know we're situated between, oops, between this building which wraps around the Sim Center and comes over here, 
that building that wraps around the Sim Center is actually the building we're in now. You know, you go out of the Sim Center modern building into the, like the mid-60s of this building. And so my understanding is situated between this 19, mid-60s construction and what's on the other side of the street, which is our traditional quad brick buildings that have a lot of age and character, that this de design just was too modern. There was too much glass. There was too much steel. It just didn't fit in the block. So that's where it went back to the architect. And then the architect comes back with this. And so a lot more brick, still has a modern design, some angles to it. But through this second stage of the process, this is what ultimately was decided on for the exterior of the building. That leads us into the third phase, where you continue to work on the design. So just like the outside of the building changed, the inside of the building continues to be tweaked and adjusted um, to meet the needs and objectives. Um, this is also kind of through one, two, and three is when you're having focus groups with all of your users, you're doing needs assessments, and ensuring that everything that you could possibly need in the building is there. Um, I can tell you that as we walk through the building, I can point to different things and say, you know, we did this because we had a faculty group tell us this is something they really need. If you go into our home environment, someone posted a picture of the home environment. If you go into our home environment, look at the cabinets and notice that all the hardware is different. And it's because occupational therapy, uh, occupational therapy faculty said students have to teach patients with different disabilities how to manipulate different types of hardware. And so there's all different types of hardware on those cabinets. So all of that comes from kind of faculty and, and needs assessment from all of your users. In this third phase, you also get to the point where you can see some 3D vectors of what the space may look like. So I'm going to show you briefly all three floors. And for those of you who go on tours, you'll see this uh, firsthand in addition to the space that you're seeing as you sit through uh, the conference. But here's our first floor. Our first floor is primarily skill space. It's two large bed labs. Those are the labs that you got your food in and where the vendors are. Um, each of those, when we're not having a conference, has 12 beds in it. And so we can do skills and practice physical assessment there. In addition, on the first floor, we have a home environment. So that's set up just like an apartment um, with a kitchen, a bathroom, um, a Murphy's bed, a living area. So any of our students who go into homes to do any kind of therapy or assessment can simulate there. We have some office spaces. We have some support. This is our storage on the first floor. And then we have what was going to be storage, but ended up being turned into office space. Um, here on the first floor in two of those multi-purpose classrooms. Many of you probably noticed on the first floor, one of these multi-purpose classrooms is used for virtual reality machines. Second floor. Second floor is all of our acute care spaces, the spaces you typically would find in a hospital. So we have an operating room, labor and delivery room, regular patient rooms, larger patient rooms, and then we have debrief rooms scattered throughout the second floor, six of them, some more office spaces, and also a multi-purpose space. I should also say that in addition to the, the, the rooms that we do simulation, we also have simulation, or we have the infrastructure to simulate in the hallways and in the elevator. So if we're doing a transport case, we can start in one room and then follow that case into the corridor, into the elevator, and into other rooms if you're doing some type of continuity of care transfer case. And then the third floor is um, our clinical skills center. So that's our OSCE lab. We have 24 rooms. Uh, all 24 rooms are identical, and they wrap around the third floor. The four rooms on the south corridor are a little bigger because we can take out the exam tables and bring in dental chairs. And so we can do chair emergencies for our dental students as well. So in addition to being a regular uh, physician exam room or practitioner exam room, we also can make these kind of dental spaces as well. The nice thing about having purposefully created spaces is that you can really design it with purpose 
So we have the inner um, hallway and the outer hallway. So the students all only see the outer hallway. We call that front stage. And then what the students don't see are backstage. This is the space that the standardized patients collect in. This is where they get trained. This is where they can change clothes, take showers, put makeup, et cetera. This is kind of all their space. Um, and they enter one side and the students enter from the other. Also on the third floor are two more multi-purpose spaces and then a simulated pharmacy. So we have a simulated community pharmacy that looks like a Walgreens or CVS. Um, we have a large pharmacy program on campus and I think about 80% of their graduates go into community pharmacy. So they see this as a valuable opportunity to not only simulate pharmacy processes, do some compounding, but then also do some behavioral type simulations. My wife is a pharmacist. She worked in retail pharmacy for a month and she said, I will never ever do this again because you're constantly dealing with the angry public, right? So people come into the pharmacy, they're sick, something's wrong with their, their prescription or their insurance. And so a lot of the, the non-technical skills that we think is important for pharmacists to have as they go into the community is the ability to interact effectively with the angry public. So we're able to simulate that here in our simulated pharmacy. We even have a simulated drive up. So one of the rooms, the room, where is it? There's a closet, this little closet right here. Is that it? Yep, that's a little closet. We'll have a green screen. There's a camera in there. The standardized patient can sit, be in the car, looking at the camera, and say, hey, I'm here to pick up my medication. And they're actually interacting with the pharmacist live here in the pharmacy. So we're even simulating the drive through in this pharmacy space. <laughs> Part of this third phase also is to look, begin looking at elevations. This is an example of an elevation. I never thought I could actually read these, but I've actually learned to read them pretty well. This is the south elevation of our classrooms where we have in the back um, some frosted glass plates that surround the door. We have counters and uh, 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 sinks in all of our multi-purpose space for when we're doing skills training that requires um, cleanup. And then all of our multi-purpose spaces have air walls that drop from the ceiling, and we can divide those spaces in two. Um, all, we, we maximize the amount of whiteboard space in all of our rooms. There's actually some meeting rooms on the first floor where all four walls are just completely painted in that writable surface. We did the same thing in our classrooms. And even the air wall, when it drops, you're able to, um, to write on that. It's also a dry erase surface. All right, so that gets us through phase three. Into phase four, where all the construction documents have to be completed and all the attention to detail. It's a super long phase of this, and it results in, you know, those big architectural sheets that you see printed. I think our book had 220 pages, and that then led us into the construction phase. To give you some timeline now, um, construction first required destruction of the prior building on the, on the same space in the same lot. So this was the fort building, um, had not been in use for some time is my understanding. It had to be torn down. That, that de demolishing, demolishment uh, started in February of 2014. Does that sound right, Nick? Sometime around then, right? Yeah, I wasn't here yet. February 2014. <clears throat> That was the beginning of the project. We're going to go through the steps, but just, you know, to spoil the ending, we didn't open until last month, two months ago. Right, so <clears throat> it, it was a longer process than we expected. It was a state process, and sometimes you just run into kinks, right? So this was the demolishment, the demolishing of the old building, February 2014. Construction was started, going through construction. Um, and dealing with some of the issues that were encountered. One of the issues, and I don't even know what it was, when they tore down that building, there was something with the, uh, there was, do you know what it was, Nick? Like there was something wrong with the water or something. There was something wrong with the drainage or something in the, in the land itself that actually delayed the project for some months. So we went through construction. We finally had substantial completion in July of 2017. So the construction company was actually finished for the most part, about a year ago. But after construction, 
comes the post-construction period and commissioning period, which I was told would take three months. We had substantial completion in July 20, <clears throat> 2017, and we just opened in May of 2018. So our commissioning post-construction took a lot longer than three months um, for a variety of reasons, which caused us to lose a lot of sleep and want to hit people. Um, <clears throat> You know, for us, part of the process was that this is a state-appropriated um, building, and so it couldn't be managed by us here in Memphis, who actually know what's going on and understand simulation. It had to be managed out of our system office, which is in Knoxville. They know not, they, they're great at building dorms. They don't know anything about building a simulation building, and so that caused a lot of delay. So we did finally have our grand opening. May 2018, and pointing out that this toad document, which I ran into later, really speaks to me now, and probably I would have approached this whole project differently, is that when you're dealing with these people, make sure you have timelines, accountability, deliverables, and documentation. And I can tell you the reason that we had such a long time for commissioning was because these things were not in place. And it wasn't always because we didn't recognize the need. It was just because the people who were managing the project saw it differently. Instead of approaching our AV integrator, we did not have a great AV integration. And I should say, our AV integrator is not um, <clears throat> exhibiting here. So all the folks exhibiting here are probably going to be just fine. We had some issues with ours. But a lot of it was because our system office dealt with our AV integrator uh, through purchase orders instead of contracts. I mean, it was just, it, it just wasn't done quite right. All right, so <clears throat> moving on. What's in the name? So we are the Center for Healthcare Improvement Patient Simulation. How do we come up with that name? We had stakeholders sit down and start, <laughs> they're <clears throat> laughing because they remember this, um, and come up with all the different names that we think we might want to be. I, I first wanted to call it the Center for Patient Safety. and. Uh, Dr. Brown, who you all saw this morning, didn't like it. And so we had to come up with something else. So this is all the names that we came up with. My personal favorite, and I think this was Nick's. Did you come up with Elvis? No. Who, it wasn't you? No. Um, Elvis, the exper experiential learning via interprofessional simulation. <laughs> that was the one I liked. However, <clears throat> After we came up with the whole list of names and sent them out to stakeholders and everyone voted, it just didn't make the top three. So <clears throat> the top three then were sent to Dr. Brown, who you saw this morning, and that's how we ended up being chips um, that way. All right, so back to my slide earlier where I talked about quandaries that you may face as you're looking at developing, designing simulation space. What about a lobby? So in our old sin space, we had a lobby that had, I don't know, 50, 60 chairs in it. And so that was a place where all the students came and they gathered before they did their simulation. Here, our lobby looks like this, which you've seen. The architect really liked the idea of creating this wood design to bring kind of a classic element to a very modern building and made, when <laughs> When I first saw these, I said, what the hell are these? And he said, <laughs> and, <laughs> and the architect said, they're bleachers. And I said, bleachers? Like, who's going to sit on those? And I'm telling you, the first day we had nursing students down there doing skills lab, and they took a break, they came out and sat on them like they knew exactly what they were for. So, <laughs> so <clears throat> we have these. I mean, this is obviously posed, but uh, they did uh, naturally find the bleachers. So we don't really have a gathering space dedicated for people coming in to do center. That's where our multi-purpose rooms actually come into play. And why we have five of those scattered throughout the building is because we intended for them to gather in these spaces and that would allow us more flexibility. So let's face it, there's a lot of time you don't need a room with 50 chairs for people to gather in. So it could just be kind of inefficient use of the space. So to maximize our flexibility, we chose to just use multi-purpose rooms for that purpose. What about offices? Uh, one of the things, so I didn't have a lot of input into design. One of the things I did change was 
we had a bunch of small offices, and we didn't have enough uh, based on the organization chart that we had proposed. So we took out most of the walls of all the office spaces and made shared office spaces, um, which I'm not sure everyone was really pleased with at first. No one strangled each other yet. So I think it's probably so far a success. <clears throat> and we have some nice gathering spaces for, oh, so, oh, by the way, so here's my shameless plug. We have empty desk, we're hiring. So <clears throat> um, we even have a bookshelf for you. <laughs> we are actually in the process of hiring a simulation technologist and also an educator. So if you know people are interested, please send them our way. All right, what about your actual sim spaces? I was, in, I was in the University of Texas Health Science Center a few months ago, and they have less space than us, but I think they have more rooms than us because they're tiny. They're tiny, tiny. So, and, and it works really well for them. And I could see how that helps get through a large number of, of students. We actually went with the larger, less space, I mean, less number of rooms, but larger spaces. So this is one of our small patient rooms. This isn't our large patient room. <clears throat> this is the small patient room, and there are four of these. Our, our goal going into this was to create a space where we could um, kind of breed interprofessional activity. And so if we want to do teamwork and we want to do interprofessional work, we need to have spaces large enough to let the team get in and get dirty. And so that's why these rooms were really designed to be larger spaces and although we have fewer, as opposed to the smaller spaces where you can have more of them. So you have to think about whether you actually want to do clinical care in the space that you're in. We said absolutely no clinical care will occur in the space we're in. It's really easy when you're in an academic institution because <clears throat> no one's really looking to you um, for clinical space. At my last institution, UAB, as people hear from there, one of our sim centers was located in the hospital. And so then sometimes it is a battle in terms of whether you um, build the space with the intention of it being some type of overflow clinical space as needed. I was in um, Singapore recently, and they're actually creating a lot of their sim spaces in the basement, and it's an overflow area. You know, the problem is sometimes they actually need the overflow space and then suddenly you can't do your simulation. So um, that's just another kind of quandary that has to be addressed as you're going through the process. Part of that clinical care also think, then has um, impact on what kind of gases you use in the building. So do you use compressed air throughout the building? Do you have real oxygen? Do you not have real oxygen? Um, we made the decision that we would have compressed air throughout the building, and the building has an um, air compressor. That's great. Uh, the oxygen outlets on the second floor deliver real oxygen from a Dewar tank that's in our loading dock. The oxygen outlets on the first and third floor are dummies, and they deliver compressed air. And the reason we took that approach was because, first of all, the compressed air was relatively free, uh, and if we were using oxygen, say, on standardized patients on the third floor, we wouldn't really want to administer real oxygen uh, in those situations. On the second floor, however, all of our acute care spaces, hospital-type rooms, we actually did see a need for real oxygen because a lot of our equipment, our mannequins, will respond to real oxygen, and so we wanted that functionality. We also wanted to be able to hook up a real ventilator without it alarming the entire time because it's only getting 21% oxygen. So for those reasons, we chose to kind of pipe in the real oxygen on the second floor but then save on the rest. What we are finding now is the downside is that when you forget to turn off the oxygen on the second floor, the Dewar tank doesn't last that long. So <clears throat> that's the downside. Another quandary, what's the ratio of sim rooms uh, to control spaces, we have a one to two. So for every two simulation spaces, we have one control room. And there was kind of a purpose for that. So this is a picture of one of our control rooms. Again, they're pretty big. 
Um, one of the advantages of having one control space for every two sim spaces is again, when you're doing a simulation in a space, assuming that you're only using one room and not the other, then you can have a group of people in there direct observing um, if that's the approach that you'd like to take. If you have both rooms running simultaneously, then it can be a little chaotic. And so we at least installed shades that would drop in the middle of the room so that if you are running both and you wanted to have a separation of that larger space into smaller spaces, then that was a possibility. Downside, <clears throat> the lights in those rooms, the sim rooms, are not usually on. And when we open the door to our debrief rooms, by design, the lights don't come on. And when it's dark in the room and a black shade is dropped in the middle of the room, you walk right into the shade. Jared did it the other day. Um, and so it's, <clears throat> we're looking at reflective tape to maybe put along the edge because it doesn't feel good when you go run in the room and that thing just smashes in your face. <clears throat> so in addition to the shade that's dropped in the middle of the room to divide it in two, if we're only using one room and we have a large group of people in the debrief room who are direct observing and there are operation technicians in the other room and the light is on, we don't want that light to bleed through. So in addition, there are shades the drop in front of each direct one-way mirror so that we can block the light bleed that way as well. Ratio of sim rooms to debrief, our ratio is about one sim room, no, so one debrief room for every 1.4 uh, simulation spaces. Uh, one to one is probably most ideal, um, however, there just wasn't the square footage and we wanted to maximize on our simulation space. And we do have some other flex spaces that we could use for debrief if we need to. Our debriefing rooms are all pretty standard, although there's a couple different configurations. This is more of a U-shape. <clears throat> and this is another configuration. All of these debriefing rooms have large screens with touch panels and we can bring up and watch video and um, <clears throat> Uh, debrief hopefully in an effective way. And then I mentioned this early space dedicated to storage. I go to a lot of sim centers, do a lot of accreditation site visits. They almost always say if I could do anything different, I would do more space. I would do more storage. More storage, more storage, more storage. So even though it's only 15% of our space, we have storage. So <laughs> this is <clears throat> a room in our basement where we store some stuff. This is some storage space. This is more storage space. Uh, this is storage space. Um, so we have it throughout the building. I'm just realizing I don't even have the second floor. so I didn't put that picture in here. So that was basement, first floor, and third floor. The second largest storage space is on the second floor, and I didn't even include a picture. This is actually in the basement. See, this was just before the conference. Um, I took these pictures just for you. These are all the beds <laughs> that belong in the bed lab uh, stored down. And for some reason, we really over-ordered in chairs. <laughs> so if anybody, if anybody really likes these chairs and would like to purchase them from us, we'll, bring, we'll give you a deal because we got lots of cases and we got lots of chairs. I'm not exactly sure how that happened. <clears throat> So a few other lessons learned as we went through this process and then we'll wrap up. I mentioned already timelines. Timelines are so important. And as the owner representative, which is what my role was in the team, it's not really my job to enforce timelines, but lesson learned is that sometimes you just gotta do it because other people aren't. Um, notice that this was the first timeline that I was given before I started work here, and the project was to be completed in December of 2016. Completed. You heard me say May 2018 earlier, right? Um, so, so much for timelines. Another lesson learned. This is a picture from one of our AV store. Well, this is only room dedicated to AV. We have some of the closets. So when the, in the original design of the building, there was gonna be a, a room in the basement for AV servers and there was going to be like a closet on the first floor for AV servers. 
once we went through the very long process of bidding out the AV um, project um, and then having to go through the bid process a second time because someone objected to the first one and we're in the state where you just have to do that. After all that, the AV integrator said, it's not going to work with this being in the basement. Like, there's too long, you know, you're doing, Lucas knows the terminology, I don't know. Whatever kind of connections we needed, it was just too far from the basement to the third floor. So we had to find a more central location for the AV closet. So we found a room in the second floor, which was soiled laundry. I'm not sure why we had a soiled laundry room, but we did. I'm not sure where that came into the space planning. My guess is we had soiled laundry spaces for just this purpose, and that is you always find a need for more space, and so you need some spare space laying around, i.e. the soiled laundry room. So a linen room, whatever it was. <clears throat> so we said, okay, this is going to be our new um, uh, AC, I mean our new AV room. So it's great. The AV company comes in, they put up the racks, bring in all the servers, put in all the equipment, all ready to go. They go to plug it in and go, oh, shit. We forgot that we need more power and that we need um, connectivity. And we need the room cooled. So we can't actually turn all this stuff on until we get what is now over here, a standalone eight-ton AC unit for that one room. <laughs> yeah, it's a big, and it took about three months to go through the whole process of selecting the AC unit, getting it approved by the state, getting it ordered, and getting it here. So a large part of that delay in commissioning that I mentioned earlier is because we didn't realize, we didn't realize, people didn't um, anticipate the needs for this AV room in terms of cooling, electricity, and connectivity until we went to plug it in. Another lesson learned, acoustics are really important. I mentioned acoustics was one of the kind of thoughts from the beginning, but recognizing there are a lot of things you can do in your space to reduce noise pollution. So we have these little seals on our doors to help um, with sound pollution. And also, as you walk through the building, you'll see like different colored panels on the walls. Those different colored panels are actually acoustic barriers uh, to prevent sound from, from bleeding as well. Oh, there's a picture of it. So in the room where the vendors are, this is what it looks like when it actually has beds in it. One has beds and one has stretchers. Uh, these green panels on the walls are, are actually for acoustics. So interpreting documents, <clears throat> I mentioned earlier, I'm much better at it now than I was before. But we have learned through this process that you should not be the approver of documents when you have no freaking clue what the documents actually say, <laughs> right? So when the AV company comes and says, here's your design, you can't just say, okay, well, it's good to me. Uh, you have to say back to the AV company, no, you need to walk me through this. And we need to actually talk about the functionality side of all of these lines and connections and wires and all this kind of stuff um, before we say that it's okay. So we may not learn to be expert interpreters, but we really need to make sure that they walk us through what the intent is. Another lesson learned is that no one knows SIM like we know SIM. We actually chose our AV integrator because they had done some SIM projects before. We thought, well, we know. Um, and then we got ready to do something like design a GUI. You know what a GUI is? Graphic user interface. So it's the Crestron panels that we use to control all of the cameras. And, um, and they just didn't seem to get it. They didn't understand. We went round and round. Eventually, we just kind of did it ourselves <laughs> and said, this is what it needs to look like. And they went, oh, OK. So even though they had this kind of like we've done sim before kind of approach, they had not done sim before the way we do sim. And so we basically had to turn around and say, this is really what it needs to be to meet our needs. Power and circuits, um, we did not have this issue. I share this from someone else who designed a center. They had a room very similar to our um, uh, virtual reality room and all of the power for that room was on the same circuit. <laughs> so when they brought up all the VR machines, everything failed. So 
ensuring that you work with your electricians early to help understand that there may be some particular areas of the building that are, that are under an unusually large load, and so that needs to be configured in the plan for power and circuits. Involve the AV integrator early. I told you we had some issues with our AV. Part of the issue was the fact that we just didn't get them signed on until late in the project. And so the way this worked, at, at least in this project, is that in the early like stages three and four of construction and the diagrams that I told you about, we engaged a third party consultant who was an AV consultant who gave us what their best guess of the AV design would be, recognizing they would not be the actual AV company, but they were helping to design the construction documents. So they went through, and this is an example, and they said, well, in your debrief rooms, you're going to want to put a camera right here on the wall. And so the construction company, following those early documents, went through and in this very expensive wood that's on the wall, cut holes like that. Well, the, the AV integrator that we actually chose and went with said, no, we don't, want, we don't want cameras on the wall, we want them in the ceiling. However, the message was not communicated. The result is we got a lot of holes that we just had to put plates over um, because we didn't get the AV integrator involved early enough. I mean, we, we had drywall going up before we actually really got our AV design done, and that's not ideal. Um, in, in <clears throat> any project. Holes, holes. Uh, cameras, so I mentioned earlier having faculty input and how that influenced our design. One of the things that we heard from our faculty was that they do so many standardized patient-based um, activities where it's really psychosocial and behavioral. And our design in the past where we had two cameras in the ceilings were okay, but they never really got a great view of the student's face. And so they want to see how empathetic is the student. You know, what's their expression as they're delivering bad news. And so we um, added a third camera to all of our examination rooms um, that looks kind of like a flying F a UFO, but you know, so be it. Seems like they could have chosen a better camera, but it is what it is. And now I don't really notice it, but it gives a great view of the student's face and we work with our um, uh, AV folks to make sure that it was in the best place so that we could get a nice view of the student's face. Planning for future growth is really important. I mentioned that we had a lot of storage space in the basement. That's really shell space that we actually can finish at a later date and turn this. So that's about it's almost 2,000 square feet that's in the basement that we can still add on um, in the future. Also, as we were approaching this, even though we have multipurpose classrooms, and even though sometimes it's set up like this picture, which is much like this room, much like we're doing now, where I'm talking and you're listening and you're tired and you're falling asleep and it's not very interactive, uh, we try to avoid creating spaces that would lend itself to one-way learning, um, such as what's happening here. So there were plans. So, <clears throat> so, so there were plans for like lecterns in front of the room, and I said, no, 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 take those out. We don't want to give anyone the idea that they can stand behind one of these and not actually um, engage in an interactive and immersive experience because that's what this building is all about. We don't want people standing in these rooms and giving lectures. They come over here for that, <laughs> not not in our building. So one of the things that we've realized going through this process, and we just heard this news recently, that, um, well, first of all, everybody wants to tour. Right? That's an issue on its own. Everybody wants to tour the space. Every program who interviews on campus and every residency program we have that use the building want to bring through every person the interviews. That can be a problem. <laughs> I mean, it's not like this space where we come in the room and we shut the doors. And it doesn't matter if people are touring outside the room. It's not really all that intrusive. But we simulate in our spaces, including our halls and our elevators, so we don't have contained spaces where people can just be wandering the halls as part of a tour. So 
it's been an evolving process to we now have floor signs and then tennis we put up a sign that says no tours <laughs> and so the people that are doing the tours hopefully will abide by their signs and know, oh well today i can't go there because they're doing a simulation there in that space so it's a double-edged sword because you got to deal with the tours and that's a pain um, but it is really important so we heard from um, our med PEG, or I guess our internal medicine chief resident, who said this year, um, well, let's just say historically, they go deep into their match list, their rank list, and oftentimes um, have a few foreign medical graduates, and it's, it's not their ideal situation. This year, although you can't attribute it wholly to this building, um, and you can't necessarily prove a correlation, but they brought every person who interviewed through our building and said, look what you get to do while you're here as a resident. <clears throat> and they said that they matched like higher than they've ever matched in the past. So you can't like, you can't overlook the effect that a facility like this has on your ability to recruit good people uh, to your programs. The last thing is assistance. This is a thing we didn't really plan well for. Like, when you have that many chairs and tables coming, and they don't necessarily come assembled, <laughs> you need some help. <laughs> so, you know, we didn't put everything together. In fact, finally, I went back to the folks who were in Knoxville who were managing the project, and I said, dude, you need to hire some people just to come put all this crap together. Like, we, our staff is growing, but we don't have time to sit around and put stuff together. So they did. They hired some people locally. It's like a little a local... Uh, furniture company that they hired some people to come in and put all the stuff together. Eh, it wasn't necessarily the best assembly job. But anyways, it was, I just think this picture's cool. Who gets to take pictures like this at work? I'm supposed to say, there's lots of hands around to help when we put stuff together. Um, I'll post this picture on Facebook around Halloween and do something with it. All right, so this is my plug for the textbook for which I get no royalties. A lot of the information... <clears throat> A lot of the information I talked about today is actually in a section of this textbook about environmental design. It takes you through the six phases that I talked about, and then also talks about other aspects of uh, designing and building simulation spaces. And I believe that is it. So I think we have a few minutes. We can do questions if there's if anyone has questions, but otherwise, enjoy the rest of your conference. Are you raising your hand because you have yes. a question? Uh, so I'm curious, what would, what would be the recommendation in terms of advice for other programs that are, are starting this journey when it comes to selecting and finding the right consultant groups to come in and make sure that the technical components that are, you know, beyond, um, are for specialists to understand? What, what's the best way to identify the correct consultants so that people can gain that knowledge without obviously having those people on their team? I don't know the answer to that question. Um, <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't mention, we did have a consultant, so the university engaged a consultant in 2013, 2014, somewhere around then. And so um, that consultant helped take them through that process of needs analysis, early design. They also were involved in kind of the AV schematics and planning and things. All I can say is if you were going through, if I was going through that process again, just interviewing all of those people, trying to get a sense of how well they understand the type of space that you need and what their experience is in your type of space. Um, it may not be a very satisfying answer, but that's, that's really the best I've got for you. I, there's not that many people out there that I know of that do that kind of consulting work. So it, it would be easy to interview some of the, the big ones, I think. Were you going to say something else? Shameless plug there, president is a design consultant, but I'll, <laughs> I'll leave that aside. For this would be one of those consultants. <laughs> hey, Scott. Do you have an easy estimation for how many learners you will be servicing here over the next period of time yet? So we haven't kept the greatest records in the past. Um, my guess. My best guess is probably somewhere around 20,000 learner hours the first year, and we anticipate about 20% growth for three years as we increase the use of the space. Um, 
that's really that's kind of a best guess right now. I don't know who's first. Yes, ma'am. So the students aren't here currently. Have they I'm not sorry? start? Have the students started? So school? yeah. So we had a grand opening May the fifth or May the eighth, something like that. However, we've had students here since we had substantial completion last year. Really, what we've done in that commissioning over the, over the past year is mostly AV. So anything that didn't require cameras or microphones, we slowly started to move into the space. So our nursing students have been doing skills in the skills lab for a full year. This fall will be their second fall in the skills lab. So we've been kind of slowly moving things over, and we're now at a point where everything is functioning. So beginning this fall, everything will be done here. And, and so, yeah, we've kind of had a, a soft opening, which is actually, you know, I can complain about the long period of time to commission, but easing into full capacity has also had some, some benefits, um, recognizing things. Yes, sir? Um, can you uh, break down your staffing needs and what you have right now? What's your background and what, uh, what else uh, your ideal team will be like? Yeah, I meant to include a copy of our org chart. Um, when I came, there were three FTEs doing SIM here. We're up to, I think, 13. We have two posted. And we still have about four more past that. So we're looking at somewhere around 18 to 20 full-time staff to support simulation. Now, what does that look like? Um, you got me, and then you got our administrative team. So there'll be about four to five on that team. That'd be finances, scheduling. We do heart code for the campus, uh, that type of stuff. So administrative arm, operations arm, which is really, really important. We currently have uh, six including five, six including Jared, right? Do we include Jared or not include Jared? OK. Um, so we currently have five. That's right. We have five total. We'll have six total when we fill this other technologist position. We have six there. Um, I, and we only have six on our org chart. Um, we kind of intentionally filled that arm of our org chart first. Um, we did have some turnover, so we're uh, filling that. But it's about six operations people. What, what are their backgrounds? The, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a mix. So our operations lead is a biomedical engineer. Um, our other specialist, um, what's your background, Nick? What do you call it? He's a paramedic slash, didn't you major in English or something? What did you major in? Bio? OK. Um, so Nick has a very background. Our other specialist uh, was a flight paramedic. Um, our technologist, we have one who, where did Jonathan go? If you see the guy running around that looks like he's 10, he is our newest technologist. He has a, bi a bachelor's degree in chemistry. Our other technologist has a AV background. And is that everybody? That's everybody for now. So our, um, I'm happy to share our job description with you. It's pretty loose. It's, <laughs> I mean, we kind of, <laughs> Which, which HR hates. They hate this idea that, OK, well, do you need a nurse? Or do you need a respiratory therapist? I'm like, well, it could be any of them. And they're like, no, 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 we can't do that. Um, you know, so they, don't, they, they like to have a little more structure around it. But it, we're pretty loose. I mean, tell us what you got to offer, and we'll think about it. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, would you change anything in your planning in order to do what we're doing here. So for instance, if we were planning a uh, center that we also wanted to host, yeah. you know, bigger things or regional yeah. things, would you plan it differently than you would if you were just reaching your local nurses and doctors? I mean, possibly so. I mean, one of the things I think was always a consideration was the fact that we didn't have a room like this in our building. Some standalone simulation centers do have more of a conferencing space with them. But we benefited from the fact that even though this building is old, it's still here and can be used. And so we didn't have to use part of our footprint to have a space like this for 300 people to convene. And so I think that's part of the planning process in terms of if you think you're going to do big events like this, you got to have a room that'll hold two, 300 people. Um, and we just didn't want to use our simulation dedicated space for that purpose. And so we used this. Um, otherwise, I think just really the storage kind of issue, again, comes into play. So, hey. hey. 
How many students do you have going through simulations in a week? So UTHSC is just the graduate professional health sciences. We don't have any undergraduates on campus, so we have about 3,500 students. Um, pharmacy, dentistry, medicine, nursing, health professions. Health professions includes occupational therapy, physical therapy, health information management, clinical lab sciences, physician assistant, although technically that's moved to the College of Medicine now. Um, so we have most of the professional health uh, professions here. We also serve the residency programs. I have no idea. Nick, how many residents do we have? Nick used to work in GME. How many? About 700 residents in Memphis. Um, so we serve them as well. Not all of them, obviously. Ophthalmology doesn't really come here for anything. So that's how many students. Is there another question? My only comment was um, that if you would held on to those equipments and furnitures to install, we would have come in and installed and got paid to. <laughs> we would have helped as part of the conference. Yeah, we could have some uh, break work and then and, uh, installing some equipment. Lance. So. Um, Yes, we have seen the demand go up, uh, partly because we have a nice shiny new building and people want to be in it. Also because the programmatic piece that I didn't talk about here and that we grow a part of our org chart is the educational arm so that we are out there kind of reminding people, hey, do you think about using SIM for this? Do you think about using SIM for that? And so we do see people coming. We see a lot of non-health folks wanting to come in and use. We're doing a lot of programs for high school students. Um, we are becoming more of an interest in terms of the community and that the Chamber of Commerce is now starting to include us in some of their tours and things like that. So it's definitely brought, I think, some level of um, recognition to what we're doing. And, and quite honestly, why we have that long name, why the, part of the reason I like the long name is healthcare improvement and patient simulation. As we can tell the story that that long name has both the what and why what we do. So the what we do is patient simulation, the why is to improve health care, and so we can help tell that story. Are we over? <laughs> Thanks. Thank you.